Dr. Ruben Zamora, Vice President of the National Assembly of El Salvador and Progressive Opposition Leader, spoke before Council on Monday, November 11, 1991, at the World Trade Center, Baltimore. Dr. Zamora's address is entitled, Peace at Last, A View from the Left. Introducing the speaker is Mrs. Sheila K. Riggs, President of Diversified Health Services, Incorporated, and Co-Chair, Board of Trustees, the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. My name is Sheila Riggs. I serve, as you know, with Charles W. Cole, Jr. as co-chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Ruben Zamora is Vice President of the National Assembly of El Salvador. He is, in many respects, the Nelson Mandela of his country, and he has devoted his political life to seeking, through political means, democracy, justice, and human rights for all Salvadorans. He is perhaps the most prominent member of El Salvador's, El Salvador's so-called democratic left, having returned to his native country on November uh, uh, 21, 1987, after nearly eight years in exile. His return was hailed by political observers and diplomats as the most significant development in the recent history of his troubled South, uh, uh, Central American nation, uh, a nation which, as you know, was engulfed in a bloody civil war uh, which began in 1980. Uh, his life has been a fascinating one. He is one of ten children whose intent originally was be to become a Roman Catholic priest. His early politicization uh, began when he helped his own parish priest, priest to organize peasants into cooperative farms. In opposing the very conservative government of General Carlos Humberto Romero, he was jailed and later released on the condition that he leave his country. After Romero's overthrow, he joined the new seemingly liberal government of the junta that replaced Romero, but soon disagreed with its form of rulership as well. He has lost his own brother to a death squad in El Salvador, and now, after many turbulent years, he is widely considered to be a candidate of the opposition for the presidential election in 1994. Will you join me in welcoming him to the council this evening, Dr. Ruben Zamora. Thank you very much, Sheila, for all the very encouraging word you have said about my person and my country. Well, my friends, three years ago, I was here speaking about El Salvador. And if somebody could remember about that, I tend to speak more about the sorrow than the hope of our society and our people. I tend to talk more at that time about how terrible for our people the war was going on, the U.S. policy was going on in our country, and so on and so forth. This time, I don't want to abandon or to leave aside the denunciation about all the problems that my country has, all the human rights violation that goes day after day. But I want to talk more about what we feel now in El Salvador, that is hope and the possibility to have soon peace. Maybe it's a new way to look at the problem, and I am convinced it is, because our society in the last, I will say, three or four years has changed a lot. El Salvador has changed a lot. And in that sense, El Salvador is very in tune with the rest of the world, because the world in the last five years has changed more than in the previous 60 years. What are the signs of hope that we see in El Salvador now? If we look at our modern history, El Salvador has been dominated by what we call militaries. That means the military controlled political life 
the military as an institution set up the framework inside which it's possible to do politics, but not outside it. It's not the constitution. It's not the law. It's what the military consider to be pertinent or possible to do, what become politically acceptable in El Salvador. And that's why we say El Salvador has been dominated in the last 60 years by the military. And in all those 60 years, we clearly could see at least four times, four periods, in which people try to overcome militaries, try to overcome that problems and to build up a sort of a democratic society in El Salvador. Very briefly, those periods were from 94, 44 to 1948, from 1959 to 1961, from 1970 to 1972, from 1979 to 81. And I recall that because for maybe for an um, American audience, all those years will sound something. 44, New Deal. 69, Alliance for Progress. 70, 72 is the exception, nothing. 79 to 81, human right policy of President Carter. You see? That means period of democratization in El Salvador or the chances for democratization first coincide with changes in the US policy toward El Salvador. <coughs> it is not that the military follow the changes in the US policy, and because President Carter wanted human rights being respected in Latin America, they started to respect it. The effect is a little bit different. The effect is that the military are so dependent on the United States, that when the US changes policy, destabilize the military in El Salvador. And because they become destabilized, people see the possibility to get rid of militaries. But there is a coincidence in modern history. There is another coincidence in all those four moments or period that all the coup d'etat in my country occurred during those years. And outside the period of possible democratization of society, there is no coup d'etat in El Salvador. Why is that? Because, as I call the coup d'etat, is a sort of mercenary instrument for democratization. It seems to be awkward, but it is the reality. Civil society unable to get rid of the military record to a group of military to do the job, to clean up the mess. The problem is that they at the beginning do it, but in two or three months, either there is another coup d'etat or the new Democrat forget about that and the old way continue on and on and on. Sometimes, in that respect, Salvadorian political history looks like, I don't know if you remember that old uh, Western film, Cat Baloo. <laughs> you know, that the sheriff unable to get rid of the bodies, go for another body, you know, to shoot the bodies in town. This big ba body came, shoot the bodies, clean the town, and in the meantime, fell in love with the daughter of the sheriff. And because that, he become a goody, you know. <laughs> in my country, happy end didn't happen. Hmm? The new military, when they clean up the mess through a coup d'etat, they seem to be not to fall too much in love with the lady called democracy. And that's why the whole thing mm, has not a happy end. But we have tried. And always, in all those four periods of attempt to democratize, democratize our society, you see an increase on popular mobilization. I recall our history just to tell you that it seems to us that now, mm, and especially since last year, it seems that El Salvador so Salvadorian society has entered into a new period, into the fifth possibility in his modern history to become a democratic society, to get rid of military domination over policies. Changes at the international level are very important for that. Of course, if the United States don't, want to, don't need to think 
anything of Latin America in terms of what the Soviet got, more or less, I think will be easier for us to advance democracy. And for the United States, will be easier to abandon its traditional alliance with the military and the, the people who guard the gates against communist expansion. I think that the changes internally in the country as well are so important. After 11 years of war, it is obviously clear for most of the Salvadorians that night that the guerrilla could defeat the army militarily, nor the army could defeat the guerrilla. And therefore, we see in the last two years especially, an important sector of private entrepreneurs coming more and more clearly into the side of negotiations, because they realize that we, there is no military victory. And, for, and therefore, there is no possibility to medium, not to say long-term, business planning in a country involved in a civil war. All those changes are extremely important and are the changes who has opened this new possibility. And it seems to us that this period of possible democratization in our society started last year and is going to finish in 94. Why? Because in this period, we are going to have the peace agreement. My hunch is that peace is going to be signed in El Salvador in the first half of next year. Now, the question of negotiation is not if we are going to have a negotiated settlement or not. The question is how long it's going to take to achieve that political settlement through negotiation. And therefore, it's a question of timing. And the time, and time is running against both sides in the world. It's running against the guerrillas because they know that the longer they, they prolong the war, less time they are going to, to have to become a political party and participate in the elections that in El Salvador is a fixed election. You cannot move the date. And for the army as well, time is running because they realize that the US administration is less and less willing to continue to give money to a war without any end. Therefore, the pressure is there. The internal pressure is there, and the possibility of a political settlement is there. What is the essence in El Salvador of a political settlement is demilitarization. If you look at the agenda of negotiation, you can see it very clearly. What is being discussed now in Mexico, as it started to be discussed in New York recently, is how to separate the police from the army and how to create a new civilian police under civilian command, how to reduce the size of the army, how to purge the officer corps and clean it up from the most gross violator of human rights and uh, most corrupt people, how to separate the intelligence apparatus that now is completely under control of the army and put it into, into the control of the presidency how to avoid or to prohibit in the future in El Salvador any paramilitary organizations. And all those things that are the agenda of negotiation is demilitarization of Salvadorian society. That's why I am so optimistic and so confident that we are going to have that in El Salvador in the near future. But having peace or having a peace agreement signed doesn't mean that the task is finished. On the contrary, having that peace agreement signed by all the sides means only that the greater task is starting because we are going to face what seems to us is the two main challenge for all the progressive and democratic forces in El Salvador. The first challenge is how to translate all the peace agreements gain through negotiation into institutional form. And the only way to do it after the peace agreement is signed is through elections. Because there is no other way. You cannot continue to shoot after the peace agreement. Therefore, the only way to do so, to make all those agreements a concrete and a specific political reality, is gain power through elections. And that's why the 94 election become maybe the most important and the most crucial election in Salvadorian modern history. It is going to be 
the first election under peace. It is going to be the first election under the process of demilitarization of society. It is going to be the first election with the full spectrum of political forces participating from the Arena Party on the right to the FMLN on the left. It is going to be an election in which we are going to change the president, the Congress, and all the municipal councils of the country. That means practically all the power is changed that year. And that's why the 94 election becomes sort of a central point in our development, in the sense that whatever we are able to advance in the process of negotiation, we have to translate it in terms of political power at the moment of the electoral process. And the chances for consolidating and expanding the democratization of the country are there and become to be discussed during that political campaign. <coughs> Maybe ARENA, the right-wing party in my country, was necessary for the process of negotiation in the same way that here in the United States, the Republicans and, um, and a Republican president was necessary to open relationship with China some years ago. Because whatever the president of the Republic, Mr. Cristiani, deal on accept in the negotiating table, it's very difficult to accuse Cristiani of being a pro-communist in El Salvador. You know. And maybe that was necessary. But the problem is that every step that is advanced in the negotiation is sort of extracted with a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of effort from President Cristiani and from the Arena Party. And after 94, we don't need that sort of thing. What we will need is a government that will expand, will consolidate and expand the range of democratic participation of all the sector of Salvadorian society. And that's why we will need a different and alternative leadership in El Salvador. Not the conservative one, I will say a more democratic, progressive one at that moment. But not only the question of democracy is going to be put into discussion in, at that moment. The other big problem and the big, other big challenge that our people is going to face is the question of reconstructing our society, reconstructing our economy. We are going to have peace, but we are going to have peace with more than one million Salvadorians who have been displaced from their own houses and are living in other places inside the country with one more, at least one and a half million Salvadorians living abroad. And the country only has between five and six million people. No. We are going to have peace with practically all our infrastructure, very, very damaged, not only in terms of bridges and roads, but in terms of schools, in terms of uh, Medicare, in terms of all the social services that have been quite destroyed by the war. We are going to have peace with a country in which at least 20,000 are wounded veterans going around. A country in which thousands of orphans are around the country. A country in which thousands of ex-soldiers and ex-guerrilleros are going to be sent out from the army and thrown into society, civilian society. And you can imagine then the immense task to try to reconstruct that society, to try to heal all the wounds, the psychological and the social wounds that 12 years of internal and civil war produce in that country. Your experience of a civil war is too old by now. It's more than 100 years ago. But whoever who read a little bit of American history after the civil war know how difficult and uh, sometime, even now, I see that some of the wounds has not healed yet. Mm? I see some Confederate banners being high up <laughs> in this country, you know. One year after, can you imagine in my country, after 12 years of internal civil war? Well, this is the other task. And that task cannot be accomplished only by one sector of Salvadorian society. It's impossible. It would try to say, look, we are the people, we are the progressive one, we are the one who represent the people, now power is for us, and we have to do it. We are going to fail. 
absolutely, we are going to fail. In the same way as if the private sector say, look, the private sector is the only one who could reconstruct the country, they are going to fail. We are, con we are condemned, happily condemned, to try to do it together or be or fail both in trying to do it. That's why it seems to us that the task ahead for us in terms of reconstructing the country is a task that has to be faced and developed by the whole of Salvadorian society. And again here, I, I am optimistic. Maybe 10 years ago, I will never dare to say something as I am saying now, that it is possible and necessary to do this thing with the private sector, with the trade union, with all the organization. No, I will not say that. Now, I say so. And I say so not only because I see the absolute necessity to do so, but because I see signs in the private sector that they as well understand many people there, the need to concert, the need to get together, the need to give up something in order to get the country going ahead. And the same sign I see in the trade union movements, or what we call in El Salvador, the private sector. In this task, my dear friends, will be very important the contribution of the United States. And I, I am talking not about the government, I am talking about the United States. Of course, the US government seems to us has to make an important contribution to the new period. At least we are asking now that they don't make the mistake that they have done already with Panama and Nicaragua. That once Violeta Chamorro was in power, they forgot about her. That once Endara was put in power, they forgot about him. Hmm? You know, and the big problem started then. What we are trying to say, look, don't make that mistake. Because the fact that we come to peace and sign an agreement doesn't mean that the country could go back hmm, to the old way. Therefore. We are trying to see how it is possible that U.S. military aid be automatically converted into social aid for the country. How, for instance, the money that now is used for buying bullets and guns is transferred for programs in which ex-combatants from the army and from the guerrilla could be integrated into the political life. And I think this is an important thing. I know that the tendency in this country is running against that. The tendency is to say, let's forget about that. The tendency is to say, too much interest in Central America because strategically it's not an important part of the world. But it seems to me that we have to fight against that tendency and put now the interest in Central America and the interest in El Salvador to a more constructive role. But not only the government. I think the business community in the United States has a role to do in El Salvador. Our country historically has not been a country for U.S. investment there. But it seems to me that if we are going to rebuild Salvadorian society, we will need U.S. investment there, private investment. We will need an investment that will create places of work there. Because right now, we have, according to the government, not the opposition, according to the government, we have 51% of the population at age, age of work out of a permanent employment. And we need to create places of work for those people. We are going to do it with private investment from the country. We are going to do transferring mm, public money from the war and from defense into social services. But at the same time, we are going to do, and we hope to do, be able to do it with people from here, the United States, that could invest in El Salvador. And I want to finish with that note. Please help our country. Now we have hope. Is to some extent in your hand that this, that hope again is not destroyed, and we will have democracy in El Salvador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that overview. And the floor is now open for questions. Yes, ma'am, in the front. I'm gratified to hear 
because I heard you a few years ago. This is very gratifying to hear what you have to say. You have had a tough time, I know. What is, how safe are you in the ensuing years to 94? I think that the problem of safety in El Salvador is a very relative one, to say at least. <laughs> I think that uh, the problem in El Salvador is that we have to win the election, but as well another task, we have to survive <laughs> and be alive to be able to win the election. You know? Just to tell you that is difficult. I think since last time that we spoke here, I think my house was bombed. <laughs> they destroyed practically the whole front of the house and part of the interior. Still, the situation, the security situation is a difficult one. But this is part of the process. You know? We are in a country that is at war, in which traditionally the way to deal with the opposition is just hitting them, mm -hmm. killing them. This is the way. And precisely we are there to change that way. Just to say, no, the way you deal with your opposition is to talk to them, to argue with them, to combat them on TV, on the radio, and so on, but not to kill them. And this is going to cost. It still is, now it's costing a lot of suffering to our people. A week ago, I was in one of the repopulation in Segundo Montes, a repopulation, I mean, people who have come back lately. And those people were telling me that they have two months without any medicine, without any doctor. Why? Because the coronel decided that it was not good for for that community to allow the doctor or medicine to enter that community, you see. And that was the situation, and they are paying for that. Um, and we scream, and we make a protest, and so on, and probably they are going to open that community for, for the doctors and the medicine. But this is the daily life, not only for us, but for thousands and thousands of Salvadorian. But the only way to overcome that is to fight now and try to change it. Um, it seems to me you face an enormous task in, in trying to create a democratic political culture. Could you talk about that a little bit? And also, could you expand a little bit on the role of Mexico? Well, I think that this is one of the central problems that we have in El Salvador. That is not going to be solved with the peace agreement. It's going to take years to really solve. That means to create a culture. Because already, our history, our political history, is a history of confrontation and not of, le let's say, rational discussion. The places in which in a modern and democratic society this open and rational, dis more or less rational discussion goes around, <laughs> like Congress, did not play that role in El Salvador. Now, just to give you an example, I am vice president of Congress, that means the National Assembly. When I took the, the the post, I say, okay, what is my, my staff? And my staff in the assembly is two secretaries, but secretaries just the people who you know, type sing. Two bellboys, I mean the people who you could send to buy cigarette or buy something or put a letter to the, that sort of thing, and one chauffeur. This is all my staff. I say, what? Where, 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 where is the, the, the advisors? I need advisors. The, and they look at me, they say, well, don't you know those sort of leftists all the time are with crazy ideas. Why? Because there is no idea that a member of Congress, not to say the, a, a common member, the vice president, will need staff. Why? Because Congress has not played the, that role of discussion. Usually, Congress is a place in which the president, who is usually was a coronel, put their friends there just to pay for favors or give them some favors. And the Congress was a sort of just man or just body. I mean, we need to not only to install into society this idea that you have to discuss, to make argument, to argue, but at the same time, we have to rebuild even institutions so basic as Congress to be able to carry on the discussion at the institutional level. That's why this is a very, very important task. Uh, the second question is about the role of Mexico. I think that the role of Mexico in this process is maybe one of the most crucial ones mm, in terms of peace. 
Mexico maybe was the Latin American country who was more able to keep communication with both sides in the war. Mexico kept communication with the guerrillas and with the government. And I think that was a sort of unique role that Mexico has been playing, the, the, the Mexican government, for the process of negotiation. That's why many of the talks are held in Mexico like they are doing right now, in Mexico City. You know. And that's why the General Secretary of the United Nations, when he started this role as mediator in the conflict, appointed four countries as the friends of the General Secretary for the process of negotiation. Mexico, Spain, Venezuela, and Colombia. And during the New York negotiations, I think the role of those four countries was a crucial one, especially one day. I remember very clear that day that seems to be that the negotiation has failed. President Cristiani said that he can't accept that. And the guerrilla said, this is our last position, I say. And the whole thing seems to be the end there. And the general secretary has put forward a proposal. And the proposal was rejected by the government. And then nothing seems to be left. And then came the four countries through their ambassador and they started to work it out, hmm, a sort of a reserve line you know, in the negotiation, and were able to get a, a, a solution to the problem. And we got the New York Agreement. That's why it seems to me it's a very, very important a crucial and crucial role in the process of negotiation. Chaplain LaCroix. Uh, Ruben, let me, <coughs> excuse me. Let me ask you a question about the uh, recent trials regarding you know, the killers of the uh, six Jesuits. Uh, how significant was the trial in regard to getting the military under civilian control? Now, it seems to me that Benavides and Mendoza were uh, military academy. People, uh, you know, the, at the cattle, the U.S. trained battalion uh, that were involved, actually four of them had admitted the killings. Uh, what does this mean in terms of impunity and really getting the military under civilian control? Uh, is this really a breach in the wall of impunity? And how far do you have to go before you really have a situation that is going to be, provide an environment for uh, justice and a decent justice system and peace and democracy? the military were able to block completely that the investigation, investigation could go up to the intellectual author of that crime. But now we know who they were. We know at what time they met. We know who took the decision. We know who say so and so and so in that meeting. And there were five. And we know that. But it's something that has not been brought to trial. Only Benavides is there. And in that sense, it seems to us that First, the, 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 the whole trial reflects how sorry is the state of justice administration in my country. It's not working, my friends. And this is the problem. Sometimes half, half joking and, and so on and teasing some uh, US uh, official, I used to say to them, look, you are crazy. Because the most difficult case involving the killing of Jesuit by officers of the army is put to be resolved by the, by the most rotten institution in my country, that is the judiciary system. You know. Right now, for instance, a lawyer there to challenge the Supreme Court of Justice and accuse the judges of being corrupt. The ne two days after, he was accused in a tribunal and an order of capture were signed against that lawyer. And the next week, the Supreme Court of Justice stripped that lawyer of all his capacity as a lawyer. Come on. And everybody's saying El Salvador, what's that? Is the Supreme Court of Justice or the Supreme Court of Vengeance or Revenge? You know. But this is the problem, and this clearly was shown by this case. But at the same time, as I say, it was the first time that a higher, high officer was put to trial and condemned. The question is, do international organizations or outside powers uh, have a role in the uh, democratization of your country after the 94 elections? Well, I think that we tend to refer most to the role that they will have to play from now until the 94 election. And for us, if we are going to have the peace, uh, the ceasefires signed by DB, say the first half of next year, the policing of that ceasefire 
as the policing of all the other political agreements, including the police agreement and so on, is going to be developed by a body that is called ONUSAL, is the United Nations Mission for El Salvador. Already, they are in El Salvador doing their job policing the agreement on human rights that was signed last year in San Jose, Costa Rica, and with a lot of problems. Mm? They are having a lot of problems. They have been very grossly attacked by the president of the ARENA party, accusing them of being pro-FMLN and that sort of thing. But they are there, and they are doing their job now. It seems to me that their presence will increase with the ceasefire because they have to police that ceasefire. And after the elections, it seems to us that they will stay in the country for the election period. And we will see what happened after that. We will see. I think it's too early to say if they could last even beyond 94. We, it's going to depend how developed is the situation, how consolidated with him is the new agreement of demilitarization, and how democracy is taking hold of the country. But my idea is the sooner, the better. You got they, a lot of they go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Ruben, I believe that in the history of this country, in regard to not only Latin America, but to the world, this country has had a tendency to discover one by one sometimes in fortunate situation, most of the time in very unfortunate one, like this decade in your country. How do you see and what is what can be done about El Salvador together in a joint effort, seeing the problem of El Salvador and the hopes of El Salvador in a larger view? in regard to the entire Latin America and the relationship with the United States? Well, it's a, it's a heavy one. <laughs> no, I think that it's very important because I don't know if I am going to sound pretentious to you, but let me tell you something that it seems to me that El Salvador in the next few years, in the following years, is going to become a sort of a very important laboratory of what is possible to do in a country. Three years ago, when I was here, I don't know if I said something, but I was repeating once and again all around the United States, that it seems to me that the Reagan administration policy toward Latin America and Central America was the sort of swan song of an era, that the era of a sort of uh, very unequal re political relationship between the United States and the rest of Latin America was finishing. That the era in which the main and almost absolute consideration in terms of Latin American policy was the security vis-a-vis -vis the international threat of the Soviet Union or communists was ending. And that's why we have this sort of explosion hmm, during the Reagan years and a radicalism of his policy toward Latin America, because it was the swan song of the era. It seems to be that I, am, I, I was right, because the Bush administration, I will say, is basically as conservative as the Reagan administration. I do not see on those terms a difference between the two administrations. But clearly, in terms of the policy toward Central America and toward El Salvador, is much more pragmatic and less and less ideological than the, than the Reagan administration was. Therefore, we are heading for a period in which the whole relationship between the United States and the Latin American countries is under review. We see some sign already. Even the case that you brought to us, the case of Haiti. I don't remember any other coup d'etat in, in recent Latin American history in which the military overthrew what could be called a very progressive president, and Aristide is a very progressive one, a left winner for the standard of the Bush administration. And I never have seen the type of reaction that the Reagan administration has had with that coup d'etat. The Reagan administration, Bush, has received Aristide. 
after the coup d'etat. Therefore, it's a difference. And we are seeing at different times now. And I think that once this threat of international communists is fading away, then maybe the relationship between the United States and us could be seen in more, I will say, rational and sane terms. El Salvador is going to be, seems to me, the main laboratory of that. Because we are going to have peace. In peace, we are going to have a right wing that is strong and is going to continue to be strong. We are going to have a left that is strong as well and is going to continue to be strong. And we are going to see if that could work it out as part of a pluralistic democracy. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Will there be a congressional elections before 1994? And if so, would you run for the president of, the, of Congress? And secondly, uh, uh, what do you think your chances of becoming president of the country in 1994? Well, I think that uh, there is no election for, congression, for Congress from now until 1994. Uh, Congress is every three, three years election, and president is every five years. And only every 15 years, both elections coincide the same year that is going to happen in 94, you know. And in terms of my, my assessment, well, the first thing is to get nominated. <laughs> and as you know, here in the United States, it's not so easy <laughs> to be nominated. But anyway, there is a possibility. People are talking about that in El Salvador. I think that uh, we have a good chance if we, the progressive forces, are enough humble to understand two things. One, that we don't have the whole truth in that country. That we cannot govern that country only by ourselves. And secondly, if we are able to listen a lot to the people. My main preoccupation now in El Salvador is that the war not only has polarized our society, and it's a very, very polarized society, El Salvador, but at the same time, the war produce another effect that is the compartmentalization of society, you know? You tend to live in your own compartment with your own friends, mm, progressive politicians, talking about problems, mm, and in the end, you end up believing that what you say and what your friends say is what the country is thinking and what the country is saying, and this is not true, to be quite frank, you know? And therefore, this is what I seems to me the humble attitude that we have to have if we want to win. Because that means we are not going to go and say, look, what this country needs is this and this and that. What we try to do is to see, to hear a lot, and to hear other people who are not with us, who are in a different uh, attitude, in a different mood, to try to understand what the country is and try to overcome this problem of compartmentalization. It's a pretty strong challenge. I understand that. Is it going to be very difficult for us? Because we, the progressive in El Salvador, as I tend to call myself the neo-radicals, we tend to be very bad at electoral politics. We tend to be very good at other type of politics, or social organizing, education, political education, but not very good at elections. And that's one of the things that we are going to need a lot of help from our friends here in the United States and in other places. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I think you're next. My question is not about your, your future position, but your present position. How did you come to the position of vice president? Through election or? It's through elections. At the beginning of this year, there was a congressional election. Congress is renewed, completely, and the Convergencia Democratica, that is the coalition of three different parties for whom I am working, we, did, we ran in that elections. We ran candidate in all the provinces of, of the country, and we did not very bad. You know. In the 89 elections, we did 3.4% uh, of the vote, and that was the first time that we ran. This time, we did 12.4%. That means we went from 30,000 votes to 130,000 votes. In practically two years, we increased a lot. And this is because people are losing fear in the country. Then 
when the election for the leadership of Congress came, it was clear that not a single party in the as National Assembly has enough vote to control Congress. You know? Neither ARENA, ARENA lost the majority that they have in Congress in this year election. Therefore, we advance the theory or the thesis and say, look, if nobody could control Congress, why don't we reflect the composition of Congress in terms of the leadership in order to make all the different parties to work together? You know, because this is the idea, to make bridges among the different fractions. And then that thesis, in the end, was accepted. And that's why I became part of the leadership of Congress. And in fact, I, I, I was, for instance, I, I took the oath to the president. And the president of Congress is, the, is one of the arena leaders. But I took the oath to him because I am a vice president, you know. And, uh, well, this is the way we have to do it. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> yes. Uh, do you see Costa Rica as a useful model for El Salvador, especially the Costa Rican military? On that regard about the military, I tend to say that Costa Rica is not the model, it's the ideal, because they don't have an army. And we, and we are going to have an army after the negotiation. We are going to have an army? Yes. 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 It's not that I like. I will prefer not to have any army at all, you know. But the problem is that what we are is ending a conflict through negotiation. And, that, and to end a conflict through negotiation means that neither one side could defeat the other, neither this one could defeat the other. And this is a, f a fundamental fact that has to be recognized in the negotiation process. If we go to the negotiation and say, look, get rid completely of the army, the government, and the army will say to us, uh -huh, if you want to get rid of us, go to the battlefield and defeat us there. And the war will continue, you see? That's why what we are proposing is not the end of the army. What we are proposing is to reduce the army and to put the army in its proper place under civilian control. Yes. Do what he did. The follow-up question is, how did Costa Rica manage to demilitarize? Because, because Costa Rica did it at an early age, because in Costa Rica the army never developed too much, and because in Costa Rica there was a civil war that was won by Pepe Figueres fraction. And when he won and defeated military the other side, he decided no more army and finished with that. But this is the difference. Figueres defeated what was called the army at that time. In El Salvador, we have to recognize the fact of life. The army has not been defeated. The army cannot defeat the insurgency, of course, but they have not been defeated. Therefore, you cannot ask for their disappearance. Would you comment on the possibility of a confederation of Central American states? And if you can envision it, uh, does it have a short-term benefit for you? Well, it seems to us that first the idea of a confederation of a sort of unity or understanding among the five Central American countries is not just a historical dream, you know, because we were united at the beginning and after the independence we divided among ourselves. Therefore, culturally and historically, we will be sort of rebuilding our original self. But the, the, the question is even more deeper than that. Economically speaking, El Salvador as a separate, separate unity is unworkable in the present world. You cannot think in terms of a market of only six million people. It's not going to work that. Therefore, the unity hmm, or the federation of the Central American countries is a necessity for our countries, not only for El Salvador, but for the rest of, of, of Central America. Nicaragua has five times the territory that we have, but only half the population. And their problem is people to work. In El Salvador, the problem is exactly the opposite. Too many people for too little places for work, you see. Therefore, if we are able to, to do this thing together, we could complement in certain respect to each other. But it seems to me that the unity of Central America is something that is not going to occur in the next four years. It's a long process. I think that, for me, is going to be the big and historical task for the next century. 
and in the next century to make of Central America what it was at the beginning of the 19th century, a unity. Given the um, global competition for investment, why should one invest in El Salvador? <laughs> it's a good question. But if you try to look more strategically at the, the whole thing, it seems to me quite clear that the United States has to develop investment in Latin America. The Eastern European countries are more under the area of the European community. And the dominant partner for investment in the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and, and so on, is going to be the European community. And there, you are going to be that in the following decades, a big area is going to be formed under the European community leadership. On the other hand, the Japanese, you get the Japanese, and the East is going to become the area of now it is, of course, but it's going to be growing the area of investment and economic influence of Japan. What is left for the United States? <laughs> this is the question. And I think that the question of investment is not only our necessity, it's your necessity as well. Especially, I, I can tell you very recently, a very important delegation of a private entrepreneur from, from Japan was in El Salvador looking for ways to invest there. Why? Because the main source of investment of Japan in Latin America is Brazil, and they need some sort of passage to that. And El Salvador is a country that goes to the Pacific. You know? In that sense, hmm, it's not just if the United States don't invest, we are going to fail. Well, do no. We will go for the European community. We will go for the Japanese as well. It's a mutual necessity. Yes, sir. In our discussions, there seems to be considerable doubt as to whether the military would respect the results of the election. Uh, but we don't mention the possibility that the guerrillas might not respect the results of the election. Uh, what is your feeling about that? If the guerrillas still exist but by 94, I mean by the time of the election, probably we cannot put all those goals that I am talking about. Our presupposition is that we are going to have peace next year, I mean, in 92. That means the guerrilla is going to cease to be a guerrilla and transform into a legal political party. And this is the point in El Salvador, that the guerrillas, the FMLN, is going to become a legal political party. In the process of negotiation, of course, part of the guerrilleros are going to become part of the new civilian police after training, of course, after training. And the other part of the guerrilleros are going to be integrated into civilian life in the same way that the soldiers, hmm, ex-soldiers, are going to be integrated. Therefore, what we are going to, to have in 94 is an ex-guerrilla participating in elections as a political party. Otherwise, if they are a political party and at the same time there are guerrillas, we are not going to accept that because it will be exactly the same thing and the same problem that we have had for years in El Salvador, that the military have their own political party and they play with both hands, you know, with the political party they have, and if that is not enough, they go di directly with the arms and with the repression. And if we are against that in regard to the army, we cannot accept that in regard to the guerrillas. Therefore, the guerrilla has to disappear or what is said now in El Salvador, they have to transform themselves from political military organization that they are now into purely political organization. Uh, I understand that uh, the, you commented on the population density in El Salvador, which I believe is the highest in Latin America and increasing. Uh, is there a feeling in the country among the leadership that this is a problem, and is there any sentiment for addressing it? But we have a real and a serious problem of population in the country. We, d we don't believe that the cause of poverty is population. I think this is, this is not true. But we believe that the increase on population is a factor that create problems for the development of the country, for fulfilling the needs of the people. 
And therefore, in El Salvador, I don't know in other countries, but in El Salvador, we need to develop a sensible policy to try to slow down the risk of growth of population. I am a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. And I know that in this point, there is difference between the hierarchy and us. But it seems to me that it's absolutely necessary in El Salvador that we do something about that. Up to now, what has been the point? We send the people outside the country, expel the, co the people out of the country. One and a half million Salvadorians are living here in Canada Australia, and Australia alone. You know. But this cannot go on and on and on. It's creating a problem, even for the developed countries, not only El Salvador, but as well other countries in that sense. But we have to try to solve our problem with education and with the support of the people. And this is something that for us has no discussion at all. What kind of an economic <coughs> system do you envision for your country? And uh, if there's an industrial component or a major industrial component, uh, do you fear the kinds of problems which other states such as Mexico have faced there? Well, let me tell you something that traditionally in Latin America, what we have is a model that has been called the model of upward, sorry, inward development. Import substitution model, that's the name it was called. That has a very strong component that is the government trying to organize to some extent the economy of the country. Now, the fashionable thing in Latin America is the opposite, to have a model that is outward. I mean, you export, export and export, and try to put all the eggs into the basket of new export. Now, this has been, for us, is that neither the two models are good. The import substitution model, the traditional one, led us to have a government that for sort of becoming the big father of the economy, make a very, very inefficient entrepreneurial class that don't take any risk because daddy government is taking all the risk for them and a very, very protected working class that in the end become quite lazy. And this is not good for the country. The other model, the, the present one that is expounded by the United States government as well, is a model that is creating a lot of polarization into the country. Neoliberal economics has produced polarization in this country. When I started to come to the United States at the beginning of the 80s, I never saw so many homeless on the street of Washington as I see now. The difference, the, the question is that here in the United States, you have a big middle class that more or less receive the impact of polarization and diffuse that. But what about that policy in a country like my country that from the very beginning, his main problem is a terrible polarization without practically no middle class? Therefore, if you introduce this outward oriented development, I mean the neoliberal economics, what you are doing is increasing the polarization in society. 